President Stover. Uh, he's going to officially welcome you, but I need to tell you a little bit of information about President Stover. Um, <laughs> which is probably going to make you, him a little nervous. But actually, all I really need to tell you is that he has been president of SEC for 14 years, and now he went and sat down again on me. Um, he has informed us that he thinks he's going to retire at the end of June. And so this will be his last official welcome uh, here at SEC with the Ag Symposium in an official presidential capacity. We hope he will be back many, many times for many years to come. Um, but if you would, join me in welcoming President Keith Stover to the stage. Well, thank you, Tammy, and thank you to the team who put this all together today. Uh, what a great day we got up to this morning. We're going to see warmer week this week. I said to Pat, there won't be anybody putting a plow in the ground this year, will there? But uh, what a great spring we're going to have, and uh, what a great day to uh, celebrate agriculture. Um, I started my <coughs> teaching career in 1971, so they, that makes me at the rule of 107. Those of you who know about the rule of 90 in Minnesota. So um, the years were fairly good in the 70s. And, uh, our family was buying up uh, additional ranches in western South Dakota because it was so good. But then along came the late 70s and the early 80s. And we had a lost generation of agriculture. But today, what's so exciting is to see the number of students in the front row. Today is about raising scholarships for students as well as learning about today's agriculture and tomorrow's agriculture. But these people are key to the future of agriculture. Uh, they'll be the next generation of producers and they'll be the next generation of employees for the firms you <coughs> represent. So what an exciting day to have them sitting right on the floor. I believe we have about 385 people registered today. But this looks like a typical 8 o'clock class at college, <laughs> doesn't it? So, uh, We'll be seeing more of the registrants coming in. So uh, I just have to do a couple of things here. Uh, and one of them is introduce, uh, I know there'll be a special introduction, but we said a year ago, I said a year ago, that we were going to create a Southern Minnesota Center of Agriculture. Our partners in that particular initiative are Minnesota West Community and Technical College and their five campuses, along with our two campuses, and in the future, we will be adding other colleges and campuses to this initiative called the Southern Minnesota <coughs> Center of Ag. And someday, maybe it'll be the rural center of agriculture all across the state of Minnesota. But we've kicked it off with our first council meeting, and a number of you in the room are part of that council. But I'm, the first step in that process was to hire a new dean of agriculture. We have a dean of agriculture at the U of M, but we have now a new dean of agriculture at South Central and Midwest, Brad Schlesher, if you'd stand, Brad. Right. You're going to get a more detailed introduction of Brad later. I need to now, at this time, recognize CHS. Do we have any CHS representatives in the room? Would you please stand if you're a CHS representative? Right over here. OK, thank you. CHS and the CHS Foundation, who are part of this new council that we've got in this new center of ag, um, are the sponsors today. They are, in fact, the presenting sponsor for today's initiative. That makes them the big sponsor. So thank you very much for your leadership and your support of students at our college and uh, the future of agriculture. This time, I have the opportunity to introduce uh, our uh, president-elect, of the Foundation Board of South Central College, and that's Pat Duncanson from Duncanson Growers to take over. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Um, your leadership at SCC will be missed, but we certainly expect to see you at future symposiums. And, and that will be a, I don't know if we'll comp a ticket either. You may have to actually buy one next year. So. <laughs> yeah, we'll look forward to that. No, seriously, I, I'm very fortunate in the last uh, five or six years that I've been involved as a foundation volunteer here at South Central uh, to, uh, to have gotten to know President Stover. Um, and very seriously and sincerely, he has been a real champion for agriculture at this college, um, seeing potential and, and making that potential grow. Um, so thank you very much, President Stover, for your leadership. Um, and thanks to all of you for attending. Um, 
So as a, as a foundation event, um, any proceeds that we have in surplus of what it costs to run this event go towards scholarship and, and programs um, here at South Central College. Um, so at this time, uh, and this is the fun part, um, that I, uh, as incoming foundation president, I get to maybe do a few more times this year as well. Um, but last fall, we awarded more than $200,000 in scholarships to 280 um, students here on the South Central campus. Uh, and many of them are, are ag students. I'd like to introduce you to some of them this morning. Um, would all of the student recipients from last year's scholarships uh, please stand to be recognized? Um, throughout the day, we hope to introduce you to some of these students and faculty associated with programs on our campus. Um, we invite all of you to, um, as we're on breakout sessions or when you're in the hallway and so forth, please walk up to a student, ask them about South Central, ask them what being a student here is like. Um, and we'd uh, certainly encourage you to do that. But at this time, it's my honor to in introduce um, the next student. Um, Julia Miller is a graduate from St. Peter High School and is currently majoring in agribusiness at South Central College. Last spring, Julia applied for SCC scholarships, as many students did, uh, but she had a, a GPA greater than 375 and a long list, a, a high school GPA, a long list of extracurricular activities. And uh, after an interview with President Stover, uh, it was obvious that she was um, a very deserving recipient of the highest scholarship, which is the Presidential Scholar, and she received a full tuition uh, here at South Central College. Please join me in welcome Julia Miller, uh, an ag student, to receive the Presidential Scholarship. Okay, thanks Pat. Um, as he said, my name is Julie Miller, and I did receive the Presidential Scholarship for this year. Um, and they told me to say a little bit about me. So I grew up on a hog farm. I currently work on a dairy farm. And um, I also have 11 pygmy goats up for myself, and I have eight steers. And my steers are my little buddies, and my goats are my silly girlies, even though three of them are boys. Um, so for me, growing up with agriculture made it eventually pretty obvious that it was the path I wanted to take and I've kind of been in and out of South Central my whole life. I went to um, summer camp here when they used to have the Kids Express here so I've kind of been in and out and it was a really comfortable school for me so that made the choice really easy for me and then on top of that the, um, the school giving me this amazing scholarship really was just incre excuse me, incredible for me. So. That made South Central pretty awesome. Um, but now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cole. Um, Dr. David Cole received his uh, master's and doctorate degrees in agricultural economics from Cornell University. Dr. Cole has traveled over six million miles throughout his professional career. He has conducted more than 5,000 workshops, seminars for agriculture groups, and he has published four books and over 500 articles throughout his career as well. So it was my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Cole. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Well, hey, let's hear a good South Central good morning. Good morning. Well, folks, uh, pleasure to be here uh, with you this morning. Uh, I will tell you, it is a pleasure to be here with you this morning because last week, uh, I was uh, down in Kansas, and uh, of course a lot of you know what happened down there. And uh, I was in Columbia, Missouri on Tuesday doing a program at the University of Missouri. It was a banker uh, uh, producer type of deal. And so I had to go to Garden City, Kansas. And uh, I called out the Garden City, Kansas to the bank that was having a bank producer seminar, and I says, do you see what's coming at you? And he goes, no. <laughs> And I says, well, there's a huge snowstorm coming at you. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that. And uh, so what happened was, uh, to make a long story short, I was supposed to be in Great, uh, Great Bend, Kansas, and then Garden City in Concordia. And uh, what happened was uh, those events uh, were canceled. They wanted me to come out there, and I says, no, I'm not going to do it because I watch this weather, and I just know the patterns. And thank goodness I didn't. 
Uh, they ended up uh, with 19 inches of snow and 40 mile an hour winds. And uh, actually three of the speakers that decided to go to the events, uh, uh, they were stuck there for three days. And uh, so uh, guess what's happening this week? Same snowstorm. Thank goodness it's down there, not up here. And uh, so I'm watching it uh, very closely because I'll be in the state of Minnesota, which I also enjoy uh, coming up to the state of Minnesota and uh, being with you. As President Stover said, 8 o'clock class. Uh, typically, it's a little bit uh, slow getting going, uh, but we're starting to fill it up. And I'd just like to say thank you for everything that you've done over the years. And uh, one of the things I'm just going to say right up front, uh, the farm management programs and uh, uh, the programs like this at South Central are very, very critical to the future of Minnesota and uh, agriculture, but also its rural communities. And uh, one of the things is we got to continue uh, as more and more of a, uh, Minnesota, but America uh, becomes more urbanized. Uh, it's very, very critical that we let our politicians know how important these programs are. And I'd just like to say that I'm an outsider, uh, but boy, uh, it's one of those things, if we don't do it, we will not see a Super Bowl commercial in uh, Super Bowl 75. And uh, so it's very, very critical uh, that we uh, uh, do this. Well, let me further introduce myself and outline how this morning's gonna go. I'm Dave Cole from Virginia Tech, been down there for 36 years, uh, officially on the faculty for 25 years, but now unofficially a guest lecturer uh, back in my classes uh, where I taught entrepreneurship, problem solving, and agricultural finance. Uh, do a significant amount of travel. Last year, 39 states, five Canadian provinces, and I also worked uh, with the Chinese, the South Africans, the Australians, and uh, uh, folks uh, from Mes Mexico, basically to say, hey, where is uh, world agriculture growing and how is it kind of impacting us uh, here? Also, I uh, would like to say, uh, that I'm a fellow agriculturalist, as I see some of the young producers in here. We have a dairy farm. Uh, we actually have two of them. We milk uh, about 235 dairy cows in total, but we're totally different. Uh, about 12 uh, years ago, we decided to put in a dairy processing unit, and uh, we bottle our milk and sell it the old-fashioned way in the glass bottle. Uh, currently, we're selling 54,000 gallons of milk a month. Uh, we're in about 90 Kroger stores, 18 Earth Fair stores, and 24 Whole Foods stores. We're not organic. We're local and natural. Uh, we are now boosted up to 43 flavors of ice cream. We used to have 41. We added strawberry and blueberry cheesecake, and it's premium ice cream, folks. Uh, you don't have to eat a whole lot uh, because it's 18.3% fat. Uh, you have to exercise a lot, and then it'll clog you up and kill you, but uh, uh, let the food police have that one there. But uh, uh, actually, it's a very, very good uh, uh, type of ice cream. Broke a record this year, 125,000 quarts of eggnog and custard. Uh, again, this year, our eggnog and custard was served in the White House. It happened to be the first lady had a friend uh, who is a customer of Whole Foods and said, hey, uh, there is uh, some eggnog and custard that's uh, pretty tasty. And so one of the things is our uh, eggnog and custard uh, indirectly uh, has been served both in the governor's mansion and also up in the White House. A little different, uh, we have 1,200 home delivery customers. Uh, and boy, I can tell you one thing. We're constantly in touch with that customer. Uh, our home delivery target customer are females with children in affordable homes. And one of the things that they will buy is somewhere about $25 to $28 a week of agricultural product. Uh, half will be dairy product, but they want the locally grown beef, they want the locally grown eggs, uh, they also uh, uh, want the locally grown vegetables. We've added that. And so a little old business in its first year was $669,000 of revenue. Uh, this last year, we just hit $7 million in revenue. And it's one of those things that uh, has been a fun business, but when I talk about managing in this super cycle, one of the things is everything that I'm talking about with you here today, when we do our business plans, and by the way, we do do business plans, one of the things is we have to incorporate some of the things that I'm talking about uh, with uh, uh, the components of economics uh, uh, related to the business. Now. The theme of the talk here this morning is managing the great super cycle. What I'm going to do is go one hour, okay? And I'll kind of get you uh, kicked off. 
and then I'm going to take about a 10 minute break and one of the things that I'm going to and don't pay attention to this gentleman right here pay attention to me students you are to go out and introduce yourself to an agribusiness person agricultural producer or anybody that's in the audience and one of the things that you're going to have to do is ask them one piece of advice okay so when I have the student session uh, which I'm going to have uh, about 45 minutes we're going to see if we can come up with 10 nuggets of pieces of advice and so I want you all out there I want you engaged I want you to shake your hand uh, with the producers and so producers uh, be ready for that uh, when I have that first break okay uh, because one of the things that is very important uh, particularly in agriculture is that we're out here and we're networking and that's what I want to see and I'll never forget going to a banker conference about oh 15 years ago and I do a lot of work for the Royal Bank of Canada they're uh, one of the big banks of, of the world and the leader of the agricultural group he required all of his bankers to wear these bumblebee type of uniforms okay they look like big bumblebees in the audience and he says, if I see any of you together more than five minutes, he says, you'll be fired right on the spot. <laughs> because he says, one of the objectives is any conference, you're to be out there and you're out there to network. So my producers here, uh, to my agribusiness folks and former farm management folks, one of the things that I really like to have you do is engage our students because this is what it's all about. So. Let's get her going and let's talk about managing in the great super cycle and uh, let's get the technology going. I'm going to go right to the computer and let's kind of, some of you <clears throat> have heard me over the past few months. I come to Minnesota quite often and so what I've tried to do is update some of the material and make sure it's fresh and where it's new and boy today. I am going to talk about land bays, and we're going to go in depth on land bays a little bit later in this talk. But let's talk a little bit about the state of the rural business, agribusiness type of economy. Folks, I'm going to start right out. There's four emotions that I'm seeing as I crisscross America, okay, in agriculture in the agriculture area. And why am I talking about emotions? 80% of all economics is all behavioral. It's a, a swing of emotions and there's four emotions that are really driving agriculture today you know what number one is greed okay one of the things is on the greed aspect is getting more cash rent getting the highest land values and boy one of the things is the greed emotion is definitely definitely out there you know what another emotion that I'm seeing anxiety a number of folks are basically saying Boy, I'm not sure where this thing is going. I'm getting a little bit cautious out here. So that's another emotion that's driving the dynamics of rural America. You know what, the other emotion, this is a scary one, that is driving a lot of agriculture today, complacency. Ah, oh, the super cycle. It's gonna go on forever. Matter of fact, world economics has changed. I'm gonna tell you right up front, no, it hasn't changed, <laughs> okay? And so those I'll, I'll build upon. But you know what the other thing is? And I'm particularly seeing it amongst my younger folks, but I'm even seeing it amongst my older folks. Uh, opportunity, optimism, okay? And so what you will have is these four emotions that are going on that's driving the structure, the dynamics, and the decision-making of agriculture as we see. And think about yourselves, greed, complacency, anxiety, and optimism, okay? And think about where we come down on the spectrum. Now, here is one thing right out. Uh, it's called the 320-260-60 rule. And everybody needs to know this one right here. There's 320 million Americans, okay? But one of the things that you're going to see is uh, a continued shift to urban suburban America. 260 million people now live in urban America. I was watching the Wake Forest basketball game the other day. Four of their basketball players don't even have driver's licenses. Why? They're from the inner city. They depend on public transportation. And one of the things that I would tell you, why is this important? 
because right there is a lot of politics, a lot of politics that are driving us. And if you think about it, by the year 2050, potentially 70% of the uh, population of the world could live in urban areas, okay? And so what you see is a tremendous disconnect, a disconnect, and boy, that is gonna be something that's gonna change the structure of agriculture. You know what the 60 is? <coughs> There are 60 million people that live in rural America. That's it. And one of the things that I'm basically going to tell you, where we had this great recession on the East Coast and the West Coast, 60 million people that live in rural America, guess what? We have seen the best of times for the past 10 years, okay? So the 320, 260, 60 rule. And to all my students in here, one of the things that's going to be very imperative for you folks is, is to educate the urban and suburban people about the importance of agriculture. Matter of fact, that needs to be part of your course. In other words, what is our public relations program? Because again, you folks know technology, you know the younger generation. Here is another element. It's called the 270, 80, 60. While there's 2.3 million farms and ranches in America, Think about this. We're down to 270,000 farms and ranches generating 80% of the production, and they carry about 60% of the U.S. farm debt. To all my lenders in here, that scares me. You know why? Number of folks say there's no credit problem this time in this buildup of this cycle. Yes, there is. The problem is all the credit is concentrated amongst a few producers. Okay, and they generally are larger. And so one of the things that I would just suggest to you is that we have this concentration of debt. So if we do have this economic variable taken upside down, it's gonna hit, it'll hit some of our larger producers very, very hard. So that number is very important. Now, let's talk a little bit about global economics. And before my students roll your eyes on this, I will tell you, if you take Europe, you take the United States and North America, and you take Japan, there's approximately 60% of the world economy comes out of that area. One of the things that I would just tell you is two things that are gonna happen over the next 10 years. You're not gonna see, you will see modest ac economic activity from these areas of the world. Why? They're laden with debt, and they have inept government, <laughs> including our own. Okay? And I'm not slamming one party or the other, I'm slamming both of them. <laughs> Alrighty? And so what that basically says, that these countries will have modest economic growth as, you know, an alternative for the next 10 years. Where agriculture in rural America is doing well is nothing to do about Washington, D.C. It's a lot to do with the BRICS and the Kim Ts. Who are the BRICS? Brazil. Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And who are the Kim Ts? South Korea, Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey. You take those countries right there, think about it. They are the size of the United States economy, which the United States economy is about a fourth of the world economy. But here's the kicker. Since the year 2000, they've represented half of the world's economic growth and when I've been working on some of these strategic committees, they're potentially saying they could be 60 to 65% of the world's economic growth over the next seven to 10 years. Now, what's interesting, they're 40% of the world population. And let's just give you the facts. Since the year 2000, think about the average household income in the United States of America. It's dropped back 13%, it's gone down. And you know what's happening? You th see this thing called the dollar? It's buying less and less, okay? All you gotta do is go to the gas pump, <laughs> all right? And you know it's buying less and less. Whereas, let's go to China <clears throat> and take the coastal area of China, where there's about six, 700 million people. They're living a lot like us now. Now, there's still 800 million people living off less than $2 a day, but their household income has increased six times while ours has gone down <laughs> 13%. Now, 
One of the things is, once your household income goes above $10 a day, guess what you demand? Processed agricultural goods. And what is the United States export? Processed agricultural goods. And what I am trying to tell you is, so goes those emerging nations' health, so goes the United States agriculture and rural America. Matter of fact, you are tied 2,500 to 3,000 miles away, much more than you are in Washington, D.C. And keep that in the back of your mind. So you know what it says? One of the things we're gonna to have to do in South Central is we're gonna to have to talk a little bit more in the future about global economics and how it's impacting. And as you roll your eyes, you know one of the things that we'll be probably doing in the year 2020, taking tours of Australia, taking tours of China. It's gonna be really, really critical, okay? To be able to understand those types of cultures. Now, that's the BRICS, that's the Kim Tees. Now, let's go around the world. Right now, let's stop off at Europe. And what's real interesting about Europe, it's about 26% of the world economy when it's all combined. But why should we be concerned about Europe? How will Europe impact the ag margins and the land values here in this area? I'll tell you why. Because you know who China's largest customer is? It's not the United States, it's Europe. And you know what's going on in Europe? Last night, I read about two hours a day. And last night, coming up on the plane, reading The Economist magazine, they basically say the European sector, which is in a recession right now, and Germany's in a recession, is basically going to struggle along. So if they struggle, China's demand for their goods goes down, and then their economy slows. See how it kind of impacts it? Now, which country do you keep your eye on in the Euro sector? Germany, fourth largest economy in the world. Past 10 years, Germany has done very well with a combined Euro. In other words, they had their combined currency. And so what's happening is, next September, they're having a major election like we had. And their leader is Angela Merkel. And one of the things is, if she's not reelected, all right, that could mean the possible breakup of the euro. And you know what that would do? It would create currency turbulence around the world. And that would come right back in to impact agricultural commodities. Now, what's real interesting on Mer uh, Angela Merkel, the chancellor, in Germany, she's receiving a lot of criticism. You know why? Because the German people are saying, why should we take care of the pigs? Who are the pigs? Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Then when she goes down to Greece, you know what's interesting? Everybody in Greece says, well, Germany, you benefited. You need to take care of us. And so what's happening is her political future is about 50-50 right now, so watch that one. And that could be a critical, critical event. Now, let's go to our friends in China. You know what's interesting in China? I just got to give you this backdrop. The other day, I'm cruising up Interstate 29, headed for Sioux Center, Iowa. Oh yeah, <coughs> Sioux Center, Iowa, where I had the gentleman that paid $21,000 an acre for farmland was in my deal. Okay, and I'll tell you a little bit about him. Well, I'm cruising up 29, had all these things about Lewis and Clark, okay? Later that week, I'm over in LaGrange, Oregon, uh, about four hours east of Portland, Oregon. And guess what? That's where Lewis and Clark were going down. And if you think about it, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, and you think about they were the real explorers, okay? We got all this GPS and all that stuff today. You think about it. And there's one thing I want to tell the students. As much as you go to technology, technology makes you dumber. <laughs> Okay? In other words, one of the things that you've got to do is take on technology with what I call common sense and emotional intelligence. Okay? And that's what Lewis and Clark had. Okay? Think about who got them out there. Okay? But when they were going up the Missouri River and then they were going down the Columbia River to find the Northwest Passage, I want you to remember this. China had been the world's leading economy for 500 years, 500 years. 
And in 1832, China was generating 32% of the world economy. Today we generate 23. They were bigger than us. But you know what happened? China became closed in. And you know, then Europe took over for China, and then we took over for Europe. Here's one thing I'm just going to tell you. As a world supreme economic leader, we have been less than 100 years old. And I, one thing that's going to challenge your generation right here is China would like that supremacy back. I work with them enough. And somewhere between 2019 and 2025, China is projected to exceed the U.S. economy. Oh, yeah. And also, it's building up its military as well. And what's going on in China right now? Uh, they have just changed leadership. And think about the new leader of China. You know what's interesting? The new leader of China, uh, he, was, grew, he had grown up as in a very, very elite Chinese family. But he was known as a princeling. And what happened was his father said the wrong thing to the former leader of China, Mao, and the family was shunned. This guy lived in a cave for 10 years. You know what he did? He worked on hog farms. Imagine a leader actually working on a farm. And you know what's interesting? When he came to the United States of America last February about this time, they wanted him to go to the White House. You know where he wanted to go? He wanted to go to the hog farm in Muscatine, Iowa, where he had spent two summer experiences. And you know when he was there, you know what he told the farmers? He basically was very concerned about a stable food supply to his people. Hey, you know what your biggest issue over in China is right now? It's nothing to do with land, it's about water. One fourth of their water cannot be used for industrial purposes. It's rotten, <laughs> rotten. And one of the things is, he wants a stable uh, food supply because what he wants to do is keep social control in his country. You know what the other element that's going on in China? They have just merged or uh, made a big trend from being a rural population to an urban population. And one of the things is they have this big disparity in income and it's creating social unrest. The other thing that we will learn, and I hope you mark this one, this is 2013, February 25th, one thing that we will learn about the Chinese is they're gonna to be tough, tough negotiators once they get the power, okay? And one of the things that they're doing is they're making significant investment in the Southern Hemisphere of the world as an alternative source of food, fiber, and fuel other than North America and Europe. And one of the things is trade will be one of the critical, critical issues, particularly with the Chinese. Uh, it's real interesting. Japan has just taken over three islands in the Pacific. And one of the things is the Chinese don't like it. You know why Chinese don't like Japan? Because of the atrocities over the centuries. And you know what they did last year? And I want you to all think about this. All of a sudden, Japan takes over those three islands. Within 60 days, you know what China said? We don't want any more of your Toyotas. It brought Toyota of Japan right to its knees. You know what else they threatened to do? Call the Japanese bonds. By the way, they finance a lot of Japanese debt. Who finances a lot of our debt? <laughs> yeah, and one of the things is they threatened to call those bonds. Folks, one of the things that we will learn, and here's one of the things that they're saying, they want this century to be their century, <laughs> okay? And one of the things is during this decade right now, they're building their platform, okay? And so your land values, your margins, are going to be competing against China. But China with strategic alliances in the southern hemisphere, not strategic or not actual agriculture in the Chinese area. So that's your global economics that is out there. Middle East, the Middle East will continue to be a time bomb. And folks, with 80% of our farm expenses dependent on oil, Think about 80%. This is why you will have volatility on the cost side. For any of you taking agribusiness right now and you have to do those budgets and you hate to do them, one of the things is this is the reason you do them. And this is the reason that when you start doing your budgets, you do scenarios with what? Petrol prices at four, five, six dollars a gallon, okay? 
That is the reason because that Middle East tends to be a powder keg and will continue to be a powder keg. And again, this is your global economics that's coming back in to influence you. Now, let's kind of move on and talk a little bit about the United States of America. I'm going to be very blunt with you. We've got this, watch, the question. I'm going to the airport yesterday. You know what they were talking? Well, Roanoke Airport may not be able to accept flights after a certain time because they're going to cut back on air traffic control. And one of the things that I will just tell you, and I, I'm going to be very blunt with you. I'm kind of uh, upset with the politicians. You've got a bunch of uh, drama queens and drama kings in Washington, D.C. that have discovered TV. <laughs> Okay, And so all this, they just dramatize it. But I'll tell you one thing that's not drama. It's our national debt. Our national debt right now, $16.3 trillion. That's so big that it just, what's the big deal? Okay, I'm going to take all the zeros off and pretend the White House is an actual household. Okay. In other words, it's our house, which it should be our house, right? All right, here is the big deal, all right? The United States, uh, okay, last year the White House, or our house, brought in $22,000 of revenue, but it spent $38,000. So we actually had a $16,000 deficit. Over the past 10 years, we've built up $163,000 of credit card debt. That's your $16.3 trillion. So how are we going to solve it? Well, one of the things that we'll do is we're going to raise tax on wealthy. And by the way, who are considered the wealthy now? It's farmers. Oh, you ought to see the USA Today about three weeks ago had a big picture of agriculture saying this is where the new wealth is. All right. Well, that's going to cure all the problems. Well, folks, if we tax increase people over $400,000, it takes $38 off the $16,000 annual deficit. Ah, guess what else we're going to do? Those farmers and those folks in rural America are doing real well. So we're just going to cut farm program payments. Matter of fact, the big talk now is changing crop insurance. Oh, yeah, it's too lucrative, folks takes six dollars off our deficit. What I'm trying to tell you is this. This is a whole lot about nothing. And one of the things that I would just suggest to you is we actually had a plan. And the plan uh, was Bowles-Simpson. And it was bipartisan. Democrat, Republican, Republican, Democrat. Some good people on there. Three bucks of budget cuts for every dollar tax increase, but it was ignored. Why? Because we're playing this politics out on TV. <laughs> All right? Meanwhile, our deficit's going up a trillion bucks a year. <laughs> okay? It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. When I was with you last year, our debt to GDP was 92%. Today, it's 105% and growing. And 41% is financed by foreigners. The number one foreigner being China, followed by Japan, followed by Great Britain, followed by the Middle East, that's a great bank, <laughs> followed by the Caribbean region, we don't even know who's there, <laughs> and then followed by Brazil. And one thing that happened yesterday, yesterday Great Britain was downgraded <laughs> from a AAA status. And folks, we were downgraded a few years ago by the rating agency. So you know what we're doing now as a government? We're suing them. We can't take the bad news. <laughs> okay? Well, one of the things is at that time, our interest rates actually went down. And as Clint Eastwood would say, we were lucky. <laughs> and one of the things is because Europe was going down faster than we were. We may not be as lucky again. <laughs> All righty? And one of the things that I would just suggest to you is, while the Federal Reserve of the United States of America has promised to keep interest rates down, it may be out of our hand. And here, any agribusiness, or any farm business, or any lender in here, one of the sensitivity tests that you do on your budgets is, what if interest rates go back to normal? What if interest rates go back to normal? And what's back to normal? 
six and a half percent. By the way, if interest rates go back to normal, six and a half percent on our national debt, our interest on our national debt will be bigger than the military budget. Matter of fact, you know one way to bring the United States right to its knees is basically jack the interest rates up, okay? And they can do it without firing a shot, okay? This is the corner we're getting ourselves boxed into, all right? But one of the things that I would just tell you is, what if interest rates go back to normal? How does it influence your bottom line? But you know what a lot of people say? My debt's fixed. Well, it is on your long-term intermediate term, but not on those operating lines of credit. <laughs> and boy, that can come in and have a big influence on your margin. So again, this is the fiscal cliff. Now some good news about the US economy <coughs> is this. It's actually making a comeback despite itself. Matter of fact, uh, the le LEI is just your lead economic indicator and uh, PMI is just your purchase and manager index. They're foretelling what's going on in the economy. Let's take the PMI. When it's above 50, it means an expanding economy. You know what the expanding economy means? You guys get jobs. <laughs> You're able to buy cars, <laughs> okay? And it, it's been uh, above 50 for the past six months. Same way that the lead economic index has been very, very positive. Here is some good news. A month ago, our housing starts, which we'd like to see about 1.1 million, uh, are now uh, 972,000, even though the number last month dropped back. But one of the things is with housing being one in seven jobs in the United States of America, this is good news. And by the way, how did I find out housing starts before the numbers even popped up were increasing? I'm in Myrtle Beach in January. You know what the taxi cab driver lady told me? They're starting to build homes here in Myrtle Beach. I'm down in Florida a week later. They said they're starting to build homes. Here's one thing I also want uh, young folks to remember. Okay, you can look at all the numbers that you want, same way with lenders. But oftentimes, numbers are backward looking. What you gotta do is always keep your eye out there and ear to the ground. I tend to talk to taxi cab drivers, shoeshine people in the airport and overland truckers. They'll tell you where the economy is going six months before the uh, economy is going there. It's just like the weather last week, okay? I got a trucker friend. And matter of fact, I listened to Flash Phelps, Sirius on Six, okay? And when I heard those truckers were having problems in Flagstaff, Arizona, I wasn't gonna go. I don't care what the weather channel says. Okay, because those folks were out there on the front line. And that is why when you start depending on technology too much, sometimes common sense doesn't prevail. Okay, but what it's saying here is that this economy is making a nice comeback. Now, for many of you in this room, not the students in here, you're all concerned about what the Federal Reserve of the United States of America is going to do. All right, can I talk to students for a second? There's probably 15 folks in here, probably got three million more or more in debt. I'll tell you what, when you sign on the bottom line, and you owe $3 million to your banker, your farm credit person, or your FSA person, and you've got a spouse up at three o'clock in the morning wondering how you're gonna pay that debt if interest rates come up, this stuff becomes very, very real. These are probably some of the things your parents never talked to you about, but boy, I'll tell you what, every producer, every banker, every farm credit person in here, and FSA person, and supplier person in here, wants to know what's gonna happen with the Federal Reserve interest rates, okay? Now, our chairman of the Federal Reserve is Dr. Ben Bernanke, all right? couple of things that the Federal Reserve did this last year. They basically have identified when they're gonna start raising interest rates. And you know what the target is? You ought to write this one down, all right? Matter of fact, for all my students, okay, you need to do a, about a one-page report on today's events. Bullet out, you know, some of the key points. Now, I don't have to worry about you because you were here last year and you always take good notes, okay? I mean that's a compliment to you, okay? Well, you've been here sometime, okay? All right, here, you got a brother, it looks like you. All right, there you go. <laughs> okay, see? He dresses just like you too, all right? Now, what's real interesting, 
that Federal Reserve is the United States of America. You've got a responsibility. You know what the two responsibilities that you have is you keep people working and you keep what they call price stability. You know what that keeps? Social control in the United States. Now, you know what's interesting? They've got a target. They would like to see unemployment at 6.5%. 6.5%. What's current unemployment rate? You read up there, that's what I project it'll be reported at the end of the week. But it's currently 7.9. It's actually 14.4% unemployment rate. That's never reported. These are the people that have given up. These are the people that have been unemployed so long. And remember this. If you're out of the workforce for more than about 12 months, you're obsolete. Yeah, it, matter of fact, the job market is actually changing that fast. And so what's happening is this. We are about 7.9%. If you start seeing that unemployment rate start going back toward 7%, it doesn't have to go to 6.5%. That is going to send a signal to the Federal Reserve in the United States of America, raise interest rates. Okay, Watch that one real closely. And it does not have to get back to 6.5. It will probably be 7 when they will start considering raising interest rates. So there goes your operating lines of credit and your cost of money going up. The other element that they look at is inflation. There's two types of inflation. Core inflation, that's without food and energy, and then headline inflation that includes food and energy. Guess what? They keep a target of 2 and 4%. Both of those are under 2% right now. Inflation is not the issue. Unemployment is too high. So if you start seeing unemployment coming back down, inflation going up, the Federal Reserve is going to start raising interest rates. Those are two things that you keep on your radar screen, okay? And watch them, watch them very, very closely. Now, what's real interesting, another element is going to occur at the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. Hey, folks, I'm going to be very blunt with you. Uh, with the NF government right now, matter of fact, everybody's dependent on the Federal Reserve to bail us out. <laughs> Matter of fact, they're creating a bridge strategy. What's the Federal Reserve doing? They're doing two things. Uh, number one, they're printing money, and they're trying to grow the economy. Because there's three ways out of this national debt. You either print money, default, or grow the economy. And you know what the Federal Reserve is doing right now? And this, I hope this doesn't go over your head. It's practical economics. What's happening is they're trying to pump up the stock market. And matter of fact, what's interesting, every time a stock goes up a buck in value, you spend four cents more. You know why? Because we feel good about ourselves, because our stocks are going up. All righty? And guess what's happened to the stock market just recently? <laughs> it's shot up. Guess who's caught on to it? Japan. What's happened to their stock market? It's up 24% in the last 60 days. <laughs> okay? And one of the things is the Federal Reserve is very, very important. And so they're trying to create the wealth effect. Also, the Federal Reserve is very important because they're trying to pump up real estate. Because every time real estate goes up a buck in value, you spend nine cents more. You wonder why? If you bought Deer stock, it's doing pretty well, or Case International, or Agco stock, it's doing real well. Folks, look no further than the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. <laughs> Being very, very blunt with you. Now, you know what's going to happen next year? Dr. Bernanke is coming up for reappointment. Insiders say he's not going to take it. And so who's going to be your next Federal Reserve Chairman? Odds on it may be Janet Yellen out of the San Francisco Fed. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay? In other words, she will tend to be slightly liberal. <laughs> all righty? And so that is your new appointee to the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. So, a couple of things. Our debt, number two, the U.S. economy is making a nice, subtle comeback. But number three, those interest rates, very, very important to track. And those will be your monitoring trackers uh, for that. Now, let's kind of move in here and talk about this supersize super cycle. Folks, I'm just going to tell you, there's been four super cycles since 1910. 
Okay? One occurred World War I, one right after World War II, one during the Vietnam era, and now we have this super cycle. When the ball went down on Times Square, December 31st, okay, think about it. This super cycle has lasted a decade, two and a half times longer than any other super. Folks, these have been the best of times in agriculture, particularly if you've been on the grain side. Been on the livestock side, it's been a rocky time. Okay, good old rocky top. Now, what are six things you've got to keep your eye on? Okay, of whether this good times in agriculture continues. First of all, watch the bricks and the Kim T's. And I'm going to give you three numbers to watch eight, five, and three, as my man here stretches and yawns. Okay, those donuts are starting to kick in on you guys. See, you'll have a sugar high for about an hour and then you're all going to collapse. Okay? Now, what is the eight, five, that was pretty good, you know, stretch out there. Okay? Now, well, <laughs> do you know him? <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. All right. See, you got some fans in here. See, you're on camera too. All righty. There we go. Now, what's the eight, five, three? If you see the emerging nations, the BRICS and the Kim T's growing at 8% growth rate, there's going to be a high demand for commodities. Corn, soybeans, pork, beef, dairy product, because we export a lot of dairy product. Drops back to 5%, you take 20% off commodities. Folks, what could be one of the things that could collapse uh, agriculture in rural America? We ever see these emerging nations drop back to a 3% growth rate, you know what it means? They are in a recession. You know what it would do? It would basically collapse land values. <laughs> it could be one of the contributing factors that could uh, collapse land values, and boy, it would knock our margins out very, very quickly. Currently, what are they growing at? 4.9. Put that one down. 4.9% growth rate because you know what China has done? They're adding tremendous stimulus to their economies. Why? They're setting on $4 trillion worth of reserves. We're setting on what? $16 trillion worth of debt. <laughs> okay? It's kind of like the neighbor has all the cash, we got all the debt. Who has the most flexibility? So watch the emerging nations because I would tell you the emerging nations will basically dictate the growth of enrollment at this college in agriculture. <laughs> okay? Now, you know what the second thing is? Watch ethanol and biofuels. Think about this, 1998, 8% of the corn crop, today 45% of the corn crop. Now, what's real interesting on ethanol and biofuels, it has been a game changer. And one of the things is, it looks like ethanol and biofuels will continue to be uh, a, a point for the current administration, okay? So it looks like that will continue. Though I was in Pennsylvania the other day and boy, a lot of the livestock farmers are against that, okay? But that's, that's the way it is. You know what the other thing is? This current super cycle has uh, not only been for agriculture, but it's also been for what? It's been for gas, mineral, and water. One of the things that you will find is Water will be the precious commodity between now and year 2050. I talked about China. Uh, it's interesting. Oklahoma, Nebraska, uh, you know, they typically get 18 inches of snow. They need nine foot to get the aquifer back up. Nine foot. And that's a major production area in the world. Now, the thing is on oil, gas, and minerals. Any of you been up from North Dakota? Any students from North Dakota? Anybody from North Dakota in here? Come on, somebody's gotta be from North Dakota. You let people across the border, don't you? <laughs> okay, no, you're, you're in there, sir, okay. Well, folks, you know, it's interesting. I, was, uh, I had to speak up in Fargo a few months ago, and I got, my plane got delayed, got in, the hotel gave my uh, room away, and uh, even though I had a guaranteed reservation, no rooms, what? Because the unemployment rate's, what, under 3%. I ended up uh, sleeping in a closet with a bunch of chicken bones, okay? <laughs> but what's real interesting, if you really look at this big super cycle, it's not only been what? It's been agriculture, but it's been oil, gas, and minerals. Uh, matter of fact, uh, it was interesting, a fellow speaker, uh, Jolene Brown, 
She happened to be at an event over in Chantilly, Virginia. And uh, she, my son was there. And she says, Casey, that's my son. Uh, he works for Deer, he used to work for the railroad. She said, you wanna go to North Dakota? She says, I can find you four jobs at $225,000. <laughs> but then she says, you will have to live in your pickup. <laughs> okay, you know, that is, in other words, the state's too hot. <laughs> Okay. Matter of fact, it's interesting. Last week in the USA Today, they showed a uh, picture of the cities, Twin Cities, and Chicago, and they showed a picture of North Dakota. Actually, North, Daco North Dakota actually had more lights than the cities and Chicago. Why? Because, what, 2,200 uh, wells were put in last year? Okay. What I'm trying to say is it's bre in pr unprecedented wealth uh, to agriculture in rural America. I was in Pennsylvania doing a tour about three weeks ago from one of the farm credit associations over there. And it was interesting. I had a dairy farmer in there. And listen to this, folks. He was milking 100 cows. Typically, the land values are about $800, $900 an acre in that area because it's rolling. It's, t it's tough country, folks. Matter of fact, if you ever saw the movie Deliverance, <laughs> you'll see some people that look like those, okay? You gotta hear what I tell them about you guys, all right? But, <laughs> okay? But one of the th interesting things is, this guy milking 100 cows, he said his land values have now gone to $13,000 an acre. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's interesting? His net gas leases, net, are $50,000 a month. And what's real interesting is, he says, here's the implications. Uh, our family no longer celebrates uh, Fourth of July together. We no longer celebrate Christmas together. You know why? Because they're all bickering over the wealth. Matter of fact, one of the things he said, he found cousins he never knew he had. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, know, you know what he called it? And here's the term. It's called the curse of wealth. Matter of fact, I will tell you, one of the things is we're seeing more stress on farm family businesses today because of all the wealth, just as much stress today as we saw during the farm crisis of the 1980s. All right? And matter of fact, one of the things that I would just suggest to you is uh, uh, you're gonna continue to see the wealth. And there is something I'm gonna tell the students, it's something I've always talked about uh, you know, uh, to this group. There's an old saying, and I see it in agriculture right now. Uh, if it grows too fast, it's a weed, <laughs> right? And one of the things is, think about this, major lottery winner, 75% filed bankruptcy within five years. Any of you watch the Super Bowl? 83% of those NFL football players filed bankruptcy or have major financial problems within five year period. People who inherit major wealth, and you know what they consider major wealth? $100,000, and I was laughed at in Northwest Iowa the other day. Because you know what that group, a couple of them said, $100,000, that's pocket change. You know, I carefully reminded them when I was in there in the mid-1980s during the farm crisis, if you had a million dollars net worth on your balance sheet, you were considered extremely rich. They forgot where they came from. And I'm seeing that too much. Matter of fact, I went right after them, kind of like Bob Knight, the old basketball coach. You don't know who he was, but <laughs> the adults know who he was, okay? But think about it. You inherit major wealth. 100,000 bucks on average, you'll spend it in 17 months and not have anything to show for it, <laughs> okay? And one of the things that I'm seeing is a lot of this is bringing this unprecedented wealth. The other element that's created this super cycle is this low value of the dollar, low interest rates created by the Federal Reserve. Let me remind you again, every time the stock market or land goes up, we feel better, we spend more. And one of the things that I would suggest to you is the Federal Reserve of the United States of America is keeping the value of the dollar low, keeping the interest rates low. And you know what this has done? It's basically spurred the emerging nations and they're buying our food, fiber, and fuel. And then right along with that, it's creating the wealth effect. How much wealth? It's brought over a trillion dollars worth of wealth to the ag and the rural sectors in the past 12 years. Remember, if it grows too fast, it's a weed. You know what the other element is? Uh, I talked about the 320, 260, 60 rule, but there's minimal opportunity investments. You know who's buying farmland today? 
about 50 to 55 percent is growing agricultural producers. Another 30 percent is 60 to 95 year olds. Why? They don't trust Wall Street, they can't say it's a blame them. And they're buying farmland. The other 10 percent is being bought by outside big block investors. TIA Kreft, the teacher annuity fund, which I'm part of just increased their allocations from $2 billion to $4 billion. Where are they buying farmland? The Mississippi Delta right now. And one of the things that you'll see, and remember this about farmland, when you see outside investors in your marketplace and when you see marginal farm ground bringing high cash rent and high values, you tend to be late in the cycle. <laughs> okay. And one of the things that I would tell you is we've got this minimal opportunity investment. And what's happening is it's actually this super cycle is creating an interesting dynamic. And I'm writing a uh, set of articles right now, trends from the road that I'm seeing. And you know what's interesting? If I go into a pure grain area, the producers at my seminars will be 15 to 20 years older. <laughs> if I mix, diversify livestock and grain, I will typically see groups 10 to 15 years younger. If it's straight livestock, it'll be the youngest ones. It's real interesting. And one of the things that we're seeing in the grain area is this, with the technology we have today, a lot of older folks can be active in agriculture until they're what? 75, 80, 85 years of age. But one thing that some of the smarter ones are doing, you know what they're finding? That they need the younger generation to teach them how to use the technology. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Uh, some of the other ones, they, you know, they just kind of go on. You know what the other thing it's doing? I'm going to hit home here pretty hard. And I did it up in Rochester this winter at a deal. It's up in Rochester. I had a bunch of older folks over on this side of the room. It was interesting. Older folks were over here and the younger folks were over here. You know what I basically said? And this is not going to be very popular, but I'm just going to say it. I said, we got a bunch of greedy older folks. <laughs> And you know, one of the things is, I, I actually kind of got in their face a little bit, and I says, they forgot where they came from. One thing I want you to remember, none of us got where we were without somebody helping us. <laughs> and one of the things that I told the older folks, this, I said, there's a bunch of younger folks over here, and sometimes they're not your family members. And remember this, sometimes your best draft picks outside your family, <laughs> that one of the things is, give them an opportunity. Give them an opportunity to you know, start in agriculture. And boy, one of the things is, I had a bunch of husband and wife. You should have seen the elbows, <laughs> OK? And one of the things is, I had this lady. <clears throat> she was about 90 years of age. She was carrying a cane. She was waving that sucker around. And they let her out of the nursing home that day. No, no, <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> During the break, she got all excited. And she came up to me, and she goes, well, I own 3,000 acres of land, and I just bumped up the cash rent $200 an acre. I don't know, 450, 500 bucks an acre. And I finally says, ma'am, I says 3,000 acres, and you're up to 450 to 500 an acre. I says, what do you need all that money? And you know what she did? She shook that cane right in my face, and she says, Sonny, that's my bragging rights down at the nursing home. <laughs> okay, <laughs> folks, I'm being very, very serious. There's a lot of bragging going on right now. No, there is, there is. And you know what I told her? I basically said, when that person's renting your farm ground, that's your long-term annuity. And are they taking good care of that long-term annuity? All right? And I, I'm being very, very blunt. Uh, these good times, sometimes we forget where we came from. All right? And so I know some of you aren't going to like that. That's fine. But again, I'm just telling it like it is. All right? And my wife and I, we're actually helping three farmers, former students of ours, OK? Uh, that's interesting, outside our son, helping them get started in their business is probably one of the most rewarding, gratifying things you could ever see. Now, these are talented people, okay, that will execute and follow through. But boy, that's one of the things we need. That minimal opportunity investment is really one of the other events that's really having a big impact. And speaking of minimal opportunity investments, got to tell you a little story. At Virginia Tech, I taught my class, and at Cornell, taught my class at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I taught evening class. You know why? If a student didn't have enough fire in their butt to get up for 8 o'clock class, and didn't want them in there. 
You know, if they complain, oh, I don't want to get up, here's a drop ad slip, get out of here, wasting my time. <laughs> And then if they didn't have enough patients set through a three-hour class, didn't want them in there, you know why? Because business requires what? Initiative and patience. Well, i got to tell you a story. I had my ag finance class. You know what I would do for my last class? Matter of fact, I would expect it from the students here today. I'm going to lecture on you a little bit today, but then I'm expecting you to be engaged with me. And I ask them to write down any one question that uh, uh, they would like to ask me for their la for the last class. As a matter of fact, I made their last class their class. So, and it could be on anything. They asked me, you coached college basketball, and I did. What was the biggest lesson learned? It was about getting good people on the bus, get the right ones in the right seats, and kick the wrong ones off. And if you get the right people in the right seats on the bus, they'll take you to the right places. <laughs> okay? They asked me where I met my wife. <laughs> bar 4.30 in the morning. No, no, I'm just, just, no, I'm just joking. Boy, she would kill me on that. I actually met her in the library. You know why? I was a student athlete. One of the things I had to use my time well, and boy, I'll tell you what, a lot of good study mate dates. <laughs> yeah, and they got me through the classes, all righty? And she's now Minister of Finance in our business, all righty? And, uh, oh, they also said, you're originally from upstate New York in the 60s. Where do you think I went? <laughs> Woodstock? You've heard of Woodstock? No, I didn't go to Woodstock, okay? My buddy Bongo Bazar did, and he never came back. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, he fathered a child there, and that one ended up being a genius in the whole thing, a bongoette. <laughs> and uh, actually, she's, she's high level in government, okay? But she came out of Woodstock, okay? But one of the uh, students in my class, and listen to this. This student was a classic C student. Classic C, he would never get a scholarship. <laughs> okay? Uh, he would attend class though, but one of the things is uh, he didn't conform. And one of the things is always full of ideas. Uh, he, he, you could tell he was going to be an entrepreneur, and I really liked this kid. And what was interesting, uh, I had a blackboard in my office. And uh, it was real interesting. I'd allow students to come in and put any saying they would want on the blackboard. Well, I happened to be out on one of these speaking tours. I came back in the next morning. I used to get in the office early after doing chores on the farm. And one of the things is uh, I looked up there on the blackboard, and James had been there. And he says, Dr. Cole, I want you to remember, your A students in your class, they'll end up being the researchers. Your B students will end up being the managers. The C students, like me, they'll end up being the entrepreneurs and the small business owners, which the A and B students work for. <laughs> he signed it, James. <laughs> 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 Folks, I got to tell you a little story. Where's my guy with the John Deere hat? Okay, somebody had a John Deere hat on this morning. Where is he? Come on now, somebody had it on. Where's Deere? Come on. Oh yeah, there you go. I'm going to. Okay, you've been pretty good. I got to tell you a little story. Teach my problem solving class last spring. Guest lecturing in it. Uh, one of my former students teaches the class. And then I came back a few months uh, later uh, because uh, James uh, had just come back. I interesting about James, he was guest lecturing in this class. James, his first two businesses he started went bankrupt. <laughs> but guess what? The next business that he uh, started and developed, he sold for $179 million. And he wrote a check out to Virginia Tech in my name. Not, I didn't get the check. But they have a center on campus in my name for $250,000. Just wrote the check right out. And so he came and lectured in this problem solving class. And oh boy, talk about a dynamic lecture. Think about it, guy that failed twice. <laughs> and he was on his third time. Well, I'm sitting in class, and we actually had farm credit folks and bank folks that happened to come that day, and we were all sitting, and he was giving a dynamic lecture. Listen to this. Kid with a John Deere hat, not you, okay, was sitting there right beside me, and all he was doing was twittering and tweetering, and you know, he was on his technology, not even paying any attention to James. I was getting a little ignored, you know. And uh, then, guess what he did? He proceeded to shut the technology down. And he says, yeah, now he's going to pay attention. You know what he had the audacity to do? Put his head down on the desk. 
with John Deere cap on. About that time, my size 15 went right into his shin. And boy, I didn't say a whole lot. I just gave him. And then, boy, at the break, I says, I took him into the men's room and I let him have it. And uh, I actually wrote an article in Soybean Digest. Is this your t child, the bottom half of the bell curve, Mr. John Deere? <laughs> okay, <laughs> nothing against John Deere, okay? And then a week later, I said, is this your child, the top half of the bell curve? One of the things that I would just tell you is this, opportunity cost. Think about it. You came in here this morning to give up something out there. It's the most important principle of life. And one of the things is you take my kid with a John Deere cap, you know where he was from? He was from a wealthy farm family up in Northern Virginia, and he was a spoiled brat, <laughs> okay? And one of the things that I would just tell you is opportunity cost is probably one of the most powerful concepts <coughs> that I could teach to each and every one of you. And again, there has been minimal opportunity investments. So those are the six things to keep your eye on now. What do you really keep your eye on? Washington, D.C. may think they're in control, but you know who's really in control? Mother Nature. Folks, last week I was watching that storm. She brought about two inches of moisture uh, to the major belt. I could tell you, we could see $9 to $12 corn, or we could see $3 to $4 corn, depending on Mother Nature. I was just with a bunch of Brazilian farmers that are getting the moisture. But then they said the Argentine farms where they're doing the beans, aren't. The Aussie that was with us the other day, he said it's dry down there in Australia. But guess what's happening in the wheat belt? What's happening in Amarillo this morning? Blizzard conditions. You ought to calve out right now in those blizzard conditions. And I, I know exactly. You go Delhart to Amarillo, I can just see right lined up across the, the road. Over the next few days, you'll see a bunch of dead cows. Why do they die? because that snow comes right in and into their nostrils and chokes them to death. I'll never forget being there about 12 years ago and just seeing cows lined up right down the highway. Those guys, it's tough on them right now. But Mother Nature is the one thing to watch for because what's happening is last year we could have had three to four dollar corn. Matter of fact, a guy that I'm on the program with, he was one of my former office mates at Cornell in graduate school, Richard Brock. We were on a program together down at uh, Tennessee Martin. I, Rich and I were talking, or Rick and I were talking. I said, Rick, we could have seen three, four dollar corn if we hadn't had a major drought in the Midwest <clears throat> you know, over in Russia and over in India. And you know what he said? You're exactly right. And boy, I can tell you, watch Mother Nature. She's going to be in our business plan, we are watching Mother Nature and watching her really control. Close. Now, one of the things that I'll tell you in Blacksburg, Virginia, we had the wettest January in history. <laughs> okay, floods, you wouldn't believe it. But Mother Nature is still in control. Now, before I give you a break, all right, grain oil seeds had long profit windows, minimal downturn, specialization is rewarded. Starting to get some complacency in management, but here is the other element. There are scenarios, and I will show you at the end of the program, because we're working with a farm that just bought $2 million worth of land. We are getting this higher fixed cost, and we are getting margin compression. And boy, we go back to 3 to $4 corn. One of the things is the fixed cost structure are going to hurt a lot of producers. And here's the other thing. There's a lot of concern for the livestock industry by the grain industry, which they should, because we need an economically viable livestock industry to have a strong grain industry. If not, we're going to be dependent on export markets in Washington, D.C. Now, over on the livestock side, here we've had short profit windows, extended downturns. One thing that we're starting to discover Specialization has become risky. Not all bad to be diversified. Matter of fact, go to California. The big feedlot dairies out there, they're bulldozing them down. They're planting almond or almond trees, depending on which area in California. They can't get that thing figured out. Are they almonds or almonds? We don't know. All right? There you got it. Now, what's real interesting is we found out that the specialization is risky. All right? 
And here's the other thing that's creating a lot of opportunity for the younger folks. A lot of folks, particularly between 50 and 65 years of age, you know what they're saying? I'm not going to feed hogs. I'm not going to feed beef cattle. I'm not going to milk cows. It's easier to make money over in the grain industry, so they're moving her out. It's actually creating opportunity over in the livestock industry. The one thing that scares me, though, folks, it's the R word. And what's the R word? It's called regulation. I'll never forget addressing the American Ag Bankers Conference in the year 2000. And I said there's this big invisible hand north of the Mexican border that would basically like to drive livestock agriculture out of the United States of America. Well, folks, you wouldn't believe the intensity is going to come in the next three to five years. Why? We have this big disconnect. Big disconnect. And it'll start with livestock first, and they'll move to the grain industry second. Come on with me. I'm up here in Minnesota in December, cruising around. And I get a call from my co-owner, Donnie. And if he goes Dr. Cole, usually it's good news. But that day he goes, Dave? And I go, oh, no, we got a problem. We did have a problem. Earth Fair stores sent us a letter with a response in 48 hours. Listen to this. Two other, quote, highly public consumers, i.e. movie stars, basically wanted to know what our dehorning procedures were and whether we docked, you know, tails, et cetera, et cetera. Well, folks, we had to have a response and a registered letter in 48 hours. What was real interesting, we had a proactive vet, part of the team about six years ago. He says, you folks are holding sale and retail. You better start using proactive practices, and you better start documenting. Thank goodness for Todd. We wrote a letter back and basically says, we use laticane before we dehorn. Now, did I use the word laticane? No. Because they wouldn't know what laticane is. You know what we said? It's Novogain. It's like when you go to the dentist office. And then you, you know, you do your thing. We try to do it at a young age. And you know what the other thing is? We have some jerseys, and that breed is really moving toward the polled animals, and we're trying to use those. We wrote that back, and it's interesting. Uh, within 24 hours, we got a response back from the Earth Fair stores. Thank you very much. It was very educational, and our two, quote, high-profile folks are happy with that. That's what's coming at us, folks. And boy, I'll tell you, every big co-op, every big agribusiness firm, we are going to get hit hard. There's no doubt about it. And so that is the dynamic. And again, this is what is coming at us. Uh, again, it's changing the face of agriculture. Now, let's stop right there because after break, oh boy, we're going to talk about land base and I'll give you a little bit of financial perspectives. Now, I've got 925 and here's what I want to happen. And I want my adults in here. Uh, to help participate in this. I want every student to meet at least one or two people. And you can do it in a group, okay? And one of the things is I want you for our session uh, to uh, get one piece of advice that they would uh, give to you from the older generation. Does that sound pretty good? And so here's, it's now 925. I'd like to have you back about 25 up. And guess what we're going to do? Is land value ready to crash? What do you need to be looking for? And then we'll talk about a uh, little financial management. So everybody's got to get up, unload, reload, and mix. Go for it. I want to see y'all mix. Shake hands. Good morning, sir.